We are live. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Ring Central Ventures, I want to welcome you all and thank you for spending the next 60 minutes with us. We have a wonderful lineup of panelists today to discuss navigating a new venture in a time of disruption. We will have time at the end for Q&A, so please feel free to enter your questions into the chat. Before I hand it over to our esteemed moderator, a quick disclaimer. This event is meant as a discussion on the current economic environment. None of the discussion points should be construed as investment advice. The opinions expressed in this presentation are solely those of the presenter and not necessarily those of Ring Central. Ring Central does not guarantee the accuracy or reliability of the information provided. With that, I will hand it over to Jim Lundy, founder, CEO, and lead analyst of Aragon Research. Jim, take it away. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, great to have everybody in the audience joining us today with a, an amazing panel. And I'm just going to kick it off. And uh, my role is to make uh, to make the panelists look great uh, with some great questions. Um, this is a, a rare occasion where we get people like this together. Uh, I'm going to kick it off and ask each panelist to do a quick intro, but uh, I'll just tee it up. Uh, first, Kira McEwan, who is the Chief Innovation Officer at Ring Central, who put this together. Kira, welcome. Uh, Anand Shadashigan, uh, who's a general, uh, partner and gen a general catalyst, and Anand and I know each other pretty well. Uh, Tim Galeri, Managing Director at Sierra Ventures. Mar Hershenshin, who's the Managing Partner at Pair VC. Uh, Rob Thesis, who's uh, you know general partner at World Innovation Lab and also a Ring Central board member. So I'm going to kick it off and maybe start with Kira to do a quick intro of yourself so the audience gets to know you. Thanks, Jim, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. And um, uh, this is uh, our first panel organized by Ring Central Ventures. Uh, that includes uh, my fellow friends. Um, investors and um, glad to be here glad that everybody is able to join and um, by way of background i've been visiting central for i think now 11 years uh, or something like that or more than 11 years and for majority of my tenure here i've run our um organiz our products and technology organization that uh, includes our product engineering in the uh, operations, cloud operations, security, uh, and IT. And uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I started uh, Ring Central Ventures. And today, I uh, am busy with Ring Central Ventures and uh, Ring Central overall strategy. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Kira. Anand, how about telling us about yourself? Of course. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and uh, great to be here. Um, uh, uh, so I'm a partner at General Catalyst. Uh, for uh, for those who may not have heard of the firm, we're about a $4.6 billion firm um, investing across stages and in across key sectors. Um, one of the one of the areas that we are investing in pretty actively is sort of this this topic that we're talking about, which is uh, AI and you know how this industry is having an iPhone moment. So you know, really excited to be part of the discussion. Tim, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Kira, for the invite. Um, my name is Tim Guleri. I'm a general partner at Sierra Ventures. Uh, we are an early stage venture capital firm. Uh, been around for forty years, investing a twelfth fund, and we do uh, uh, early stage uh, B2B investing. So we'd like to be the first institutional check. So we consider ourselves uh, sort of long haul partners for startups that are innovating in the B2B sector. And I have uh, a particular love and appreciation for Ring Central. Uh, Kira and I uh, founded Octane together, which was a company in the CRM space. So I come from an operating background to VC and I've been at Sierra for uh, 20 plus years. So thank you for the invite and uh, great to be uh, as part of the panel. Mar. Hi, my name is Mar. I'm a managing partner and co-founder at Pair VC. We're a seed fund. Um, we actually just closed our fourth uh, fund, which is a $400 million fund. We, um, we invest very, very early. And the mission for us hasn't changed since we started 10 years ago, which is really help uh, founders find that product market fit before we send it to everybody else in this panel. Um, we are generalists, although, um, you know, we have specialists within the team. 
people that cover enterprise tech, consumer, life sciences, healthcare, et cetera. And we've invested a lot of our resources on the platform side. Thank you for having me. Great. And Rob, why don't you wrap us up here? Okay, Jim, thank you. Thank you, Kira. Uh, I think I know many members of the panelists over years in, in, in the business. My name is Rob Theus. I'm a general partner and chief investment officer at World Innovation Lab. Um, we are a venture fund and also a fund fund. Uh, our firm invests in the US, Japan, and Europe. Uh, we do a lot of the direct investments, um, basically a multi-stage direct investment entity. And then we also deploy capital to, to the major funds throughout the world. And um, in addition to that, we also deploy capital to emerging managers. Uh, in, in both uh, effort, we you know provide value when companies want to enter Japan. We're probably the best platform in, in, in making that happen. Um, also been privileged to have invested in Ring Central, been on the board as a lead director um, almost for 14 years, I guess. And, um, and it's, uh, it's been an amazing ride, a great company to, to, to be associated with. And again, thank you for having me participate here. All right, well, the uh, panel, we have some great stuff to discuss. The first one, which is uh, going to be, be interesting to hear all of your perspectives because you are investors and many of you have operating backgrounds. Uh, the growth potential presented by AI and the you know fury of discussions around generative AI. So I want to basically start it off with what do you think is happening here and what is the potential for um, startups? Who wants to kick it off? Yeah, um, Jim, I can probably kick it off, you know, uh, and and um, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of interesting ideas here. I think I think what we're going through, as I just mentioned earlier, is a bit of this iPhone moment um, for for the AI industry uh, and, uh, you know, the coming together of really four things um, uh, uh, in, in our view. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, the pieces uh, being assembled over the last five, six years or so since the you know, attention is all you need paper came out uh, in 2017. Um, and it's really, the four things are data, compute, talent, and algorithms. Um, you know, and all of these, the, the uh, die has sort of been cast now, but the pieces have been coming together for a while. Um, and so to go through each one of those, I think with data, we're seeing you know, important sources of data that become uh, key for algorithms to get trained. Um, we've seen the algorithms themselves get more sophisticated, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, what what kind of uh, uh, work is possible through the core uh, large language models, as we've come to call them. Um, and then the really interesting thing is just the speed at which the iteration is happening, uh, which is largely driven by, you know, the compute and the people. Um, for context, you know, uh, the BERT large model, um, which was which has been there for a long time. Uh, was a chat GPT-3 is 470x uh, greater number of parameters. So I think like to, the way at least I see it is that's what has changed in recent times. Um, yeah, Jim, you'd mentioned like we know each other from past lives. At 5.9, we sort of looked at, for example, what percentage of contact center queries could be automated. And we sort of tried all different versions of you know, that exercise and we ended up at like high single digits. And I think that percentage can um, be blown wide open, you know, and get to as high as like 30, 35, 40, 50% over time. Um, and so it's a really, really interesting sort of uh, moment where these four things are coming together. And really uh, it's a moment where innovators can sort of choose where to, where to take that. So I'll just pause there and love to get other folks' ideas on top of that. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll jump in. Um, uh... Thanks, Anand, for those comments. I think uh, I, I couldn't agree more. If, you know, when I looked at the the frenzy with which AI has been moving over the last uh, eighteen months, I think it certainly reminds me of uh, you know the mosaic browser and the iPhone, right? Like it's just like your brain just explodes and you start thinking of all kinds of uh, possibilities. I think in addition to the combinatorial effect of the four vectors that Anand talked about, the other thing that uh, strikes me and struck me was that you know ai is not new obviously we've been you know introducing that into the enterprise tech for a long time 
But this uh, discriminative AI, which is like all the old techniques that focus on classification and prediction, et cetera, was the old, old, and the new is this, the power of generation, which is like, I think really strong. That's sort of one point. The other is that I think uh, AI uh, researchers in the past were working on very compartmentalized AI. So, you know, there was research going on AI for images and AI for sound and AI for touch and AI for language. I think that's all collapsed into a single pool now where it's all sort of concentrating the research on LLMs. So what that does is it creates this logarithmic growth in the power of the LLM core and the, then the applicability of that into enterprise use cases, which obviously kind of the investors on this panel got to unpack uh, through the eyes of the entrepreneur. And I think that's where we're going to see some tremendous translation into you know, value creation in the enterprise. So super exciting time and, uh, you know, happy to be here. Uh, lots of work ahead of us, uh, for us, all of us. Mark, what are your thoughts? Yeah, maybe uh, I obviously agree with uh, you guys as this mosaic moment. I think one of the really interesting things is that um, not just the speed at what technology um, has been improving over the last, you know, couple of years, and I think the rate grows exponentially with time, it's actually the way it's been accessible to people. It really, you know, when the mosaic came out, people kind of saw what could be possible. And today it's the same. I think if you look at ChatGPT, um, you know, in two months, they reached 100 million users. I think it's the fastest consumer app ever uh, in terms of growth, right? Everybody, even, um, you know, my older relatives will use ChatGPT and, uh, folks that have nothing to do here are using it for things like, you know, figuring out what cocktails to have at their wedding. I mean, it's, you know, it's some things we don't really talk in our meetings. So I think that's um, really incredible that because it's so accessible, um, what's made, uh, what's made it possible is a lot of companies at the application layer to get started that are uh, seem magical, but can be actually put together in a few hours in a hackathon. And um, that's really remarkable. I think the first time I went to one of these AI hackathons, I saw the a first project, which was an ad tech project, and I was just amazed. You know, you give your notes, you summarize questions, whatever. Um, and then I went to the next one, it was exactly the same, right? Uh, so it's accessible, it's accessible to everybody. And I think we need some of these creative people to really try to figure out what you can't do that is not linear thinking around it. Kira. Well, I think I agree with everything that was said before. This is a, this is a time like we haven't seen for a while. Uh, and maybe since the uh, revolution that internet brought about or everything, all the business models that we know um, to exist prior to that have changed. And it seems like this will be another uh, revolution like this where business as we know it today will will, will evolve. Uh, whether this is planning for a trip where you can, you know, you can now ask chat GPT, you know, tell me what, what should I do? I'm in Chicago for three days. What should I do? Uh, or whether it's uh, automating back office processes or figuring out how to write better code, which is done already. Um, and of course, what's uh, dear and near to Ring Central and what we think about is how do we make people's daily business interactions, business communication and collaboration, how is that going to change and how um, are we going to make it such with the with this generative technology, where we really can can focus on things uh, that we do best and uh, really truly uh, relegate the repetitive uh, tasks to uh, this generative technology uh, that can run our our calendars and uh, can uh, figure out. Uh, who is in the meeting at any one time and, and what they said last and, and put it all together and provide you really was a very, very efficient way of going about business. Uh, these are all the possibilities that are just that uh, we're still scratching the surface. It's, just, it's hard to think of what's it going to look like a couple of years from now. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And, you know, we've certainly seen one of the things I've noticed uh, relative to this being whether it's the Internet moment or the iPhone moment is a lot of business owners now realize that AI is real and they cannot escape it. Where maybe a couple of years ago they said, you know, you know, that AI stuff is not real. So I guess for the panel, what do you what do you see happening as far as deal flow? How's deal flow changed for you? On your portfolio. I can address that partially, um, and this is essentially a little bit of what Kira mentioned about just the beginning of the internet. Um, several observations, at least on deal flow. Um, <clears throat> deal flow has been very active in this area. A lot of companies, a lot of entrepreneurs that have been funded. But an interesting observation is if you compare it back to the internet days, um, the amount of capital that's gone into this is unprecedented, which is terrific. But if you try to compare that, if we had this much money, I guess back when the internet started, um, everyone that sort of touched the internet would have gotten funded. So let me give you the example. Um, everybody that worked at CERN, at CERN, at Tim Berners-Lee probably would have gotten $100 million. Um, everybody at DARPA in the, that touched the internet would have gotten $100 million each. Everybody that worked at Urbana-Champaign <laughs> on the browser would have gotten $100 million each. So, so whether that should have happened or not, don't know, but that's kind of what, what, what's happening on, 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 on the deal flow side of things. So yes, uh, good capital. I think capital will drive innovation, but again, in, in some of this thing, I just wanna circle back a couple of other observation is that we're still in the early stages of what the implications here. And, and one of the things I worry about also is um, artistic creativity versus you know things that should be scientifically correct in terms of being able to do this. Um, and what I mean by this is you know a lot of the generative work that's happened is fantastic if you're producing um, videos, photography, you have a lot of artistic license and that accuracy doesn't need to be there. However, if you are recommending things and you are doing paralegal briefs, that has to be very accurate. So, so the, the, there's a combination of what I said between you know artistic creativity, and and what is should be factually co 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 correct, and 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 then yeah, and then the the last piece when you talk about deal flow is that not only companies are are getting funded, but there's the whole implication of open source, and I think this is what's changed from before and today. I think you will see the advancement of the open source of this capability <clears throat> going to be equal. And what it will allow a lot of <clears throat> other innovation that occurs not only in the United States but other countries to be able yeah. to take advantage of this. I think uh, you know to add Jim to that, it's interesting. So I think something that Mar just pointed out, and I think uh, Jensen Huang said it yesterday or the day before, that everybody becomes a programmer, right? So this thesis of because prompt engineering is so easy and relatively straightforward and then obviously you can you know natural natural language ask any questions right and you know let your imagination run so i think a combination of everybody can become a programmer right and the uh sort of availability of, of cheap capital or you know relatively cheap capital and obviously infinite compute and infinite uh you know cloud, cloud resources that are available you're seeing just, I think we're seeing the deal uh, pace accelerating. I will say that, you know, there's also a lot of uh, trend and I'm sure the other VCs on the panel will, will agree that there's a lot of gen AI washing <laughs> of every deal that's going on. So, you know, you know, people that have whatever company, you know, they come to your office now, it's all gen AI something. So I think uh, we as VCs have to really sharpen our thinking on uh, looking underneath the cover and really seeing uh, the real uh, teams uh, and the real tech from the pretenders. So that's uh, some additional work, uh, but it's a very, very active time in the market. And the last thing I'd say is that I think there's a tremendous run possible in real value creation, because if you look at the map, you know what, um, IT and everything combined is 5 trillion, the you know world GDP is 97 trillion. There's a massive runway available to kind of transform industries with, with technologies such as these. So. Um, there's lots of uh, opportunity ahead, but uh, you know, uh, tread uh, tread carefully. I, you know, I I have maybe two observations. One is that you know um, the the deal flow has changed dramatically in terms of what we get. I think if you're a founder today, 
you hear from your friends that if you're an AI company, it's going to be easier for you to raise money. Um, so that's one thing that's in their head. The second thing is that if you're a founder and you're starting a company today, you have to use some form of generative AI to have some sort of innovation and disrupt the incumbents, right? So I think those two things are, you know, making, like you said, team, everybody that comes to us to pitch us has some form of generative AI some, somewhere. Anyway, so that's one bucket. The second is that I think you, when people say generative AI companies, uh, you know, in my mind, there are five types of companies. One is uh, kind of those, um, the application layer AI companies. That's one bucket, but, you know, there's the foundational model people, the copilot specialized foundational model, you know, LLMs. There's the big compute clouds and even some semis, and then the tooling companies, right? So, um, if I look at our deal flow, I would say 80% plus is on the, in the application layer, because it's really easy again to, to make those companies right today. And they will exist. I mean, why wouldn't <coughs> any of the companies, the big companies that exist today be completely reimagined using generative AI? I think absolutely. I can believe that in every, in every vertical, right. Um, but there's a limited supply of you know, highly capable, deeply technical folks that can go and, uh, you know, uh, rethink what some uh, chipset for AI on the edge would look like, for example, right? Um, so anyways, that's that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, what I would say is that, um, you know, every company that, if, if, you, if like we monitor a lot of companies over the t over time, because, uh, as, as, as a venture arm essential, we also do a lot of testing and a lot of working with uh, entrepreneurs just by bringing technology into it essential. And what I've noticed is every pitch, I think like Mark said, is now, uh, if they were NLP before, it's now all gen AI. It, it's almost like every every company has rewritten uh, what they're doing in terms of generative AI. And, and I think the hard thing is really distilling the noise from reality and who's gonna, who really has some uh, technology that is truly value added on top of the platforms that are rapidly being developed so that they're actually solving a real problem in a unique, unique way and have uh, sustainable value. And Han, what are you seeing on deal flow? Um, yeah, I, I, I think a lot of uh, a lot of what folks shared, like we're, we're fully in agreement, we're seeing those as well. The one thing I would say is uh, there's certainly a little bit of uh, what has happened in Gen AI and the level of excitement? Um, you know, we I, I was just reminding myself that it, it's six months this week since Chat GPT came out, um, but it feels like you know five times, ten times longer than that. Um, and so the cycles are uh, the disruption cycles are so short at this point. Um, we sometimes joke if like something we invest in this week could be disrupted in a couple of weeks, as opposed to you know a few years. Uh, that it takes for an incumbent to be created. And then the other, the other question is, uh, we saw that, you know, NVIDIA is the new entrant to the trillion dollar club. Uh, we uh, are taking a lot of time to understand where the value creation versus value capture um, would happen um, in terms of, uh, you know, there are gonna be some picks and tools makers um, like every gold rush who are gonna be very successful. Um, right, so that could be the GPU chip makers, that could be the big tech companies, um, and so on. Uh, and so we're we're thinking through where the value capture will happen. Um, you know, not just where value is created. Um, and that's a that I, I think to Tim's point, you know, you need to sort through that um, very carefully. Um, and then I would say uh, one of the things that's interesting that ChatGPT has done is really thrown uh, this. Uh, it's it's it sort of fired up people's imagination, right? Uh, the idea of applying an LLM to a very important scale problem is not new. Uh, back when I was in Facebook, you know, we were trying to solve, um, you know, things like uh, terrorism-related content not appearing on on Facebook at all uh, through LLMs, but nobody saw that because those co that content never appeared on a on a scale service um, like Messenger or Facebook. Um, what has happened is, you know, LLMs and all the computational work on the back end have <laughs> given a front end and an interface, which is, you know, I think uh, Tim and Mar called it the mosaic moment, which which is a, like a great way of summarizing that. So we're seeing just, you know, a lot of ideas come up 
Um, maybe some are very sophisticated, some are not, but they're fired up by this, this idea that, you know, um, com complex AI could be given a simple interface. And so we're seeing a lot, lot in that direction as well. Yeah, you know, I think uh, given, given, you know, we see, we see a lot of, you know, have a lot of interactions with startups and a couple of years ago, I used to have to say, you have no AI and they would argue with us and then they finally cave and say, yeah, you're right. We don't have any AI. So to the point about the AI washing, but I'd like to get your, a little bit of your, you know, vision. What do you see happening, you know, two lenses, six months from now versus like two to five years from now. So what, what do you see happening right now, like the rest of this year? And then what happens after that? Now, why don't you go ahead and like start us off? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, I think the, um, most companies are going to um, solve for two kinds of problem sets, right? One is um, what what all of us, you know, focus on um, with our startups in the early days, which is uh, is there strong product market fit for what they're building, and not just something that is a flash in the pan, but you know something that can you know uh, be converted into a moat and something that's uh, a little bit more enduring. And so I think in the next six months or so, we'll see a lot. A lot of companies in the first mile of the marathon, so to say, you know, um, trying to solve an important problem, uh, trying to establish product market fit. And one of the areas we think is very interesting is how, um, you know, all the advances that we see more horizontally get applied to verticals. Uh, so we started with, you know, co-creating a company in, in healthcare and where LLMs can be applied into, um, into healthcare, as an example. And we see that as more of a general model for how verticals will adopt um, LLMs and some of the advances in artificial intelligence. Um, in, the, in the slightly longer term, um, I think it's really up to all of us as a society, various stakeholders, to think of how we land these advances responsibly. Um, you know, I think in the last 10 years, uh, you know, and I was part of this in my operating roles and saw some of this firsthand. Uh, we saw some of the impact of not being very responsible about the growth of these consumer services. And we saw, you know, whether it's misinformation, whether it's, you know, people um, having sort of uh, consuming or over consuming content in social media and so on. So I think there'll be a huge emphasis on what we call responsible AI. Um, and, uh, you know, I, unfortunately, it, it is going to be a multi-stakeholder um, uh, effort. You know, everyone from the technologists that build the foundational models, the practitioners, uh, the consumers uh, who, you know, probably would have to moderate some of this consumption. Um, certainly all of us here as investors and, and builders and, and even policy makers, right? We had, you know, a bunch of Congress hearings um, on this topic, um, you know, a few days ago. Uh, and so I think that that topic has already become an important um, conversation. Um, and we actually think that'll, that'll manifest in a few different ways, right? We, we think it's important to think about fairness and inclusion, um, especially as AI, uh, uh gets more prominent and, uh, spreads across products, um, security and privacy and how people's data gets used. is going to be an important question. Um, safety, you know, so sometimes it might literally involve people's lives, um, uh, especially if it gets applied to healthcare and education and so on. Um, and then transparency and agency, right? Like uh, there's some talk about explainability of models, you know, understanding um, if a loan gets rejected on the back of AI, you know, why was it rejected, for example, and a bit more context and transparency. Um, so I think in the in the five-year context, uh, we're going to have a bunch of companies that start to do well, but other stakeholders will have a lot of, rightfully so, a lot of questions about how responsible are their uh, are they about their approach to, you know, uh, building around AI? Yeah, I think, uh, Jim, my perspective is, you know, like most things, when there's a mosaic moment or what have you, right, there's lots of, like, uh, hype and no standards and uh, lots of, uh, you know, um, overestimation of the impact, potential impact of the technology in the short term. And we, as an industry, tend to underestimate the impact over the long term, right? And I think um, uh, generative AI and chat GPT is going to go the same way. Um, so I think in the short term, there'll be you know lots of confusion, lots of dollars deploy, deployed, lots of dollars wasted. Um, but then ultimately, we get to the efficient frontier where you know kind of usage patterns are going to 
uh, appear and reference architecture are going to appear that is will be the standard way to apply this technology to you know enterprise workflows or enterprise uh, cost centers as Anand was saying in healthcare for instance so I think uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to be very mindful of that exact human psyche and uh, be very uh, sort of uh, you know uh, very thoughtful about what those reference architectures need to look like and what is it that the best entrepreneurs that always have the best answer uh, what are they building and then looking for that in the companies that we invest depending on the use case um, so I think uh, we have to be thoughtful as a team uh, we've uh, you know we obviously have uh, a few decades of experience we've seen multiple cycles before and have uh, you know, all the all the marks in the back of our back, you know, when we did things wrong. So that <clears throat> institutional knowledge and, and, and the way to execute through a hype cycle, which we're in right now, is coming to play. And hopefully we come up at the back end with some, you know, intelligent investments. But uh, uh, it's, it's uh, fun times for sure. I, I would... Uh... I totally agree with you. I mean, I think um, if you think of these hype cycles, uh, somebody told me this is this kind of this under damp second order system. You spike and eventually you settle. So we are now with all the early winners and <clears throat> the web. I don't know if people use you know remember Excite, right? But there was it was an early winner and people were very happy. And then you know obviously there's a long term winners and the same here. Um, I think one of the challenges. This is like a hundred X though, you know, like you got, everybody was saying earlier, it's moving faster and there's a lot more money, right? So I think it's a very under damped system that is going really, really fast. Um, I think a lot of folks will ask, I mean, internally at pair, we'll have a lot of questions about, okay, what does the world look like in six months in the AI? Are we, is open source going to win? Um, which LLM will it, are all the foundational models going to be the same and they're going to be, um, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. Is all the money in the applications? Should we, it's, you know, who's going to take over NVIDIA at some point, right? Anyways, there's a lot of those questions that are even hard to, uh, even internally at pair, we, we don't completely all agree. So, you know, it's, it's very TBD and it's hard. It's really hard to break. I even went to ChatGPT this morning as I was preparing it's really bad at predicting. I was trying to ask, you know, what will happen in six months? What will happen in two months? And um, it couldn't really answer those questions. So as you guys know. <laughs> Rob, what's your take? Um, I agree with everything one that in the panelists said, you know, there are going to be various iterations of this thing. Um, a couple of uh, other considerations that companies are trying to sort through these days is um, the the data confidentiality of corporations. So if you're in the healthcare business, you have HIPAA compliance. If you're in banking, you have a certain degree of, 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 of confidentiality that you need to observe. So construction of the data, and then more importantly, the federation of the data and what is going to be kept inside, how do they get linked? How do you implement it? Um, do you do obfuscation of of in using encryption capabilities. So these are all the, 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 the nits and bits and pieces that people are trying to, to, to sort through. So again, not disagreeing with everyone else uh, here. I agree with it, but I think the, the, the near term is just sorting through the, the, the details of, of how this will evolve. And then what you serve up internally to your customers versus uh, the generic out there can be very, 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 very different. So, you know, that that's just, you know, considerations that people need to look at near term versus long term. Okay, we kind of got to move on. There's uh, another big discussion that's going on. And again, you're all investors. There's been kind of outside maybe of the AI area, a little bit of an economic downturn. Um, what do you give, you know, what are you looking at as far as your portfolio? And, you know, and what are you, what are you giving as advice to your portfolio companies? Um, Rob, go ahead. Oh, Rob, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I think we've gone through a period of where capital was able to flow relatively freely 
And um, with that, um, several things have, have happened. So that's one dimension. The other dimension is with the, you have to look at this from a practical standpoint. Um, there is, on the macro level, there is an economic slowdown because of the interest rate hikes. Um, and what is in hap happening here, most companies, whether you're in tech or other industries, the CFO is told to say no. <laughs> so, uh, so deals are getting pushed back. Uh, items that would <clears throat> would have made sense are having and generic spending is getting cut back. So uh, that ultimately is going to trickle down to all kinds of businesses, and businesses are are starting to slow down. And and the net of this is when you try to backward solve. If you're a a, a company that had lofty projections or aggressive growth, um, you may not be able to achieve that. So what you, you know, businesses are all doing is effectively readjusting what they think they can grow, including to what they're going to spend, and therefore the word efficiency has come into many places, not only large companies and small companies. And ultimately what it hits is if you're a small business or you know, if you're in the tech business and you need to preserve capital so that you can have a balance adjusted growth rate with your your your, your capital spending and that's kind of what we're uh you know advising to our, our portfolio companies and to the funds that we work with and they're all doing the same thing and and, and the key is capital preservation is important until you can reach those milestones that make sense for you to to, to go out and raise additional capital Yeah, you know, maybe I will mention brief a uh, couple of things. You know, we we are seed funds, so we typically are dealing with companies that need to find product market fit. And then, of course, we have the second half of the portfolio that is, um, you know, in later stages. I think, um, you know, we've seen that uh, um, it's it's really hard to raise those growth rounds today at the valuations that you thought you would be able to based on what you closed last. So I think a lot of people on that stage, on those uh, later stages um, are trying to make their money last longer, uh, build stronger companies, et cetera. Um, that's one thing. I think at the seed stage, everybody's investing in seed. The growth people cannot invest in growth. They have to do something. So, hey, here's here is seed. And we have this generative AI is amazing. So. One of the questions I have is where, you know, seed is so busy and valuations, nothing has changed, uh, but uh, series A's have changed and series B has changed. So maybe in a couple of years, we'll also see some adjustment um, to what people think about seed, CBD. Uh, today though, it's La La Land. And the second thing I think we are telling our portfolio, especially if you were started two or three years ago, is like, get your engineers in one place and your product people, and please, you may be building this product, but be aware of this new technology that is out there. And if you don't adopt it, uh, you're going to be reinvented, which is, you know, uh, something um, that I think is really important to if we have money in early stage companies, in, but not super early. So. Yeah, um, so you, it, go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Kira. All right, all right. I'll just say from kind of, I'll give you a corporate view. And the corporate view is uh, a lot of companies that came to us and said, oh, please invest or, you know, would you like to invest two years ago, one year ago at crazy valuations um, that uh, we passed on and uh, are, you know, just not even for uh, using stuff. The company wasn't interesting. The valuation was extremely high. So these companies are coming back now and saying, well, you know, we'd like to be acquired for um, uh, a much more modest ask. So I basically second everything that uh, um, uh, Mar said in that is, and, 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 and really Rob said is be conservative was, was how you spend the money uh, you know, and make sure it's spent on building uh, the right technology uh, and finding the right market fit and and don't you know don't spend because large companies are not spending either so everybody's is in the, on a diet so it's yeah. healthy um, yeah, thank you. Two, two, quick things, two quick things to add to this um one i would say um the first question we usually ask in most pitches is um you know just the story of why they decided to start this company um, and, 
why this idea means something um, to them more than almost anything else. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's called founder market fit or what have you, right? So I think um, mo more than ever, I think founders are dedicating a large chunk of their lives to, to an idea. Um, I think just making sure it is the most, uh, it's the thing that they're most passionate about. It's probably like the thing I would um, say, say to founders. And then the other thing is, you know, we sometimes ask um, uh, sort of what is the advice that they would give in terms of what's changing and what's different, and what, what should they do now? Uh, there's a famous uh, question where someone asked Jeff Bezos, like, well, what's changed now? What would you do differently? And the opposite of that is basically if you ask what will always stay the same, um, right, over the next 10 years, uh, in, and in that business, they say no one's ever going to say, I'd like my packages to arrive really late or I'd like my packages to cost more um, or I'd like to have lesser choice in terms of what I want to buy. So some things are always going to be the same um, and consumers or businesses will never sort of um, want the opposite of what you're trying to build. And so you can really in invent and build against like a small set of parameters that are probably never going to change. Um, and so I would really find those uh kind of what is sort of a, a a a thing that you can bet on for like the next 10 to 20 years that it's probably going to get you know better and better or worse and worse as the case might be and then really build and innovate towards that yeah I, i'll just uh, maybe add uh, that the um the challenge with this uh, super efficient market is that no idea is unique right so Every company, every category you pick, there's seven people. And if you think that too, you haven't discovered the other five, right? You just haven't. So uh, we are uh, very methodical about, you know, kind of uh, figuring out which horse to bet on. And I think it, it, uh, once we have figured out the problem that we're trying to get behind, because I think given that we do seed investments, we have to take a decade long arc to build a great company. And uh, in every single case, and obviously I think the valuation question that uh, was being discussed, we just walk away. If uh, you as a founder are not responsible enough to think that raising a crazy amount of a crazy valuation doesn't put you at a significant uh, sort of uh, disadvantage uh, and, and you're just like causing life to be healthy yourself and your board members, then you know we don't deserve to partner. So we just walk away from those deals. So the other six are probably more rational. We'll find find somebody else, and then instead of that set, I think finding a, a, a entrepreneurial team that is flexible, and 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 super hungry to Anand's point, uh, you know, testing like what is this a burning pain? Those are the ones that really sustain uh, Jim through this trough in the market, because uh, one has to go into these deals and make sure that they're not coming back to market for at least twenty four months. Because by the time they that that time comes, hopefully their operating metrics are better and the market is better. At this time, fundraising for a Series A would be more plausible. So those are some of the inputs into uh, figuring what the fund or seed company to invest into. Yeah, before we move on to our lightning round with our best advice from our panel, one thing I've observed is it's one thing with the uh, with the founders, but the other thing I would just say is, you know, we've been kind of on a, a mission to challenge, you know, um, companies that, you know, how well do their product management, product managers and their engineers understand AI. And so sometimes the founders can try to fake it, but if the team doesn't get it, that's kind of a pretty heavy lift. Um, so I'm sure you guys see that as well. Um, okay, so. I'm somebody that wants to start a startup. What advice are you going to give to them if they want to start a company right now? I'm sure you're doing dealing with this with pitches every single day, but what advice are you giving? And again, this is a giving out to the audience. You probably have people that are going to listen to this, trying to figure out like, what well, what should I do? Uh, you know, in this era of Gen AI, and I want to start a company. Kim, you, you lead us off again. Lightning round. Keep it short. Sure. Um, I, I think the the first thing is to um the tooling and the tool set and a technical co-founder obviously is, is something that you'll need to get to but the first thing is to figure out the problem you're solving and ensuring it's an aspirin problem not a vitamin problem and the way i test for that is when these teams walk in i want to see it written down 50 customer detail notes and if they don't have that in detail it just shows that you you don't have a founder that is prepared mind about the pain 
um, you know, I, I, there was a T-shirt somewhere I remember that you know teams sometimes fall in love with the uh, what they're building and not the problem or you know something around that effect. And I feel that 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 is the wrong uh, founding team to invest into. That look at this, you know, uh, gizmo I've created. You know, what you want to really know is what's the problem you're trying to solve, and have you talked to and done the hard work of talking to 50 customers or whatever the number is, and really synthesizing exactly the problem you're going to go after, and then apply the new technology, which is Gen AI and on all these derivatives at solving the problem. So that would be my uh, not so short advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I would say uh, we always give the same advice independent of time, but uh, I think number one is do something that you are very familiar with. So know your customer, I think like Tim was saying, and also I think know your market. I, I think in Silicon Valley, we're all kind of have this design thinking men mentality. Let's make sure we do customer development and that's absolutely necessary. But I think the best founders have a vision that um, is bigger bigger than what their customers tell them. They know what their, the market is gonna be and or look like in five, 10 years. I say they live in the future and they come to tell us. So I think both of those things are really important. Um, and the second thing is that you have to focus on the metrics that matter. In the companies I invest, it's all about finding product market fit, which is first, build something someone loves and next is build a growth engine that can scale. Um, and there's a lot of fake metrics that are good for social media, like the total money raised or employees or advisors, or I don't know, uh, followers on LinkedIn. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters unless you build a product somebody loves and you can sell it efficiently. So we, we try really hard to keep people focused on that. Um. I'll I'll just uh, couldn't agree more with what you know Tim and Mar were saying. I'll I'll just say uh, just you know a day in the life, uh, especially if you're in the first uh, if it's your first company, um, uh, and I've heard this like classic uh, um, dilemma, which is called the Stockdale paradox, right? So um, you'll find yourself like solving things that you think like if I don't solve this problem, it's all going to be over, and it probably is um, sometimes the case. Um, but you also believe at the end of the day that, you know, uh, everything is going to be great. Um, and so I think it's this classic dilemma that you're going back and forth between those two, sometimes once or twice a day, sometimes, you know, um, even multiple times on the same day. Um, and just, you know, that, that just to normalize that, especially in the macro that we're in right now, um, those cycles are probably going to be more intense and more frequent. Um, and just maybe develop a network that like helps you work through that. Um, because, you know, um, I think it's probably going to be here for a little bit, you know, next nine to six months or so, where even if you're building a Gen AI company, um, you're still in a tough macro, uh, if you're trying to get enterprise customers to buy what you're selling and whatnot. Um, and so I would say just kind of, you know, become very comfortable with the Stockdale paradox that you're solving whatever the problem, uh, there is today, but you're believing that everything is going to be great, you know, in, in the long term. Yeah, and just to add, um, everything that everyone articulated is correct. Um, th there's always a fine line between the painkiller, right, the solving the problem, and the greenfield opportunity. Um, and those are very challenging uh, decisions that have to be made. And there are opportunities that still lies in, in, in both of them. One just takes a little bit longer, and because a lot of things have to happen to to manifest itself. The, the second part, um, what, what what I have seen interesting over the last five to seven years is um, entrepreneurs that are a little bit confused about building a business based on pure technology, right? Versus building a business that uses technology and the margin structures and the business leverage are very, very different. And what's happened here is there's a convergence because of that confusion that but it's like I always ask, what is the technology differentiator that you that you have developed that will set you apart from er, everyone else versus, oh, I am using this particular technology that's already been pre-built, yada, 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 and therefore I can get efficiencies. So very, very different. And, and I think in terms of competitiveness and sustainability and durability, 
those businesses are very different. And those that are not truly using technology as a differentiator gets commoditized very quickly. Again, just very fine tuning and, and thinking, but just you have to be very specific and in, 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 in thinking through uh, what that is, what business you're trying to build. And just to just to add to that, I think Gen Gen One of uh, AI companies many have not really succeeded because they have not been able to scale, and they have not been able to scale because they have not been able to offer solutions that were easy to implement. The implementation, the implementation and maintenance itself of the solution just took a, a lot of work um, and a lot of people. So, in the spirit of uh, generative AI and automation, think of the solution that is much easier to adopt because that is a huge barrier uh, for an enterprise to um, to, uh, to to ultimately embrace the technology is, is adoption and maintenance, and that uh, is not solved well with uh, first gen of, of AI companies. Hey, Jim, okay. can I uh, make one more point uh, that might be helpful for the audience, which is sure. that um, some verticals that have been extremely unsexy uh, because they've been, you know, low growth margins, uh, low net margins, low growth, right? Um, I want the entrepreneurs from those verticals, if they're listening to this, you know, uh, this web webinar, to really. Uh, get a lot of enthusiasm about the potential of transforming those verticals into exciting growth companies because one of the things that um, Gen AI has the potential of doing is taking 20, 30, 40 points of cost out of the PL, making that unsexy vertical super sexy because the market ultimately buys two things, top line growth and EBITDA. So I think there's an opportunity to reinvent what you know the market is traditionally cast as unsexy verticals to invest into and therefore create 10, 40, 100 billion dollar companies. I think you'll see that shift and these entrepreneurs have an opportunity of, of taking that, those dusty old sectors and making them quite sexy for forward looking markets. So um, I think Anand talked about healthcare. We have the same instinct around that. There's lots of uh, uh, under automation and cost in that PL that can be kind of displaced and the other verticals like that. So I think there's a uh, there's a fresh set of eyes that needs to be looked at uh, at those verticals to capture this opportunity. Okay, this is awesome. We're going to be entering the lightning round of Q&A. <clears throat> We've got a couple of questions around this whole idea of building a moat uh, you know, around, you know, the company and defensible positions with AI. And the question is, can you really do that in the Gen AI or can you build a defensible position? I mean, I have some ideas around that, but uh, Tim, why don't you go ahead and uh, discuss that as far as defensible positions? Yeah, I think um, uh, there are a couple of things, right? So one is, uh, and maybe this is controversial because some uh, investors love investing in kind of lower level plumbing like vector databases and and you know prompt engineering or what have you and i think my view is that those uh will those problems at that level uh, will get solved by the you know the the the, the big five uh, that are creating core architectures in gen ai right but i think my view is that uh entrepreneurs and i've already seen this and investing behind this that you take the portion of gen ai that makes sense to the vertical or the use case that you're applying it to. And then the balancing architectures have to be built to create this reference architecture I was talking about before, and then building a company on it. And in doing so, you're taking the best of both worlds, right? Which is needed because customers don't want errors, don't want hallucinations, don't want transactions to be slow, don't want costs to be high. So all those things are still the classic needs of the enterprise. And so entrepreneurs have to create that, I guess, that melting pot of technologies and take it to market. And I think those are the best teams that are building the most innovative, responsible products, uh, you know, based on Gen AI. So I think that becomes a moat. And I think on the other side, on the old verticals getting reinvented, I think it's a business process and expense being reimagined using Gen AI techniques. And I think those are the two natural moats that are, that's going to come out of this first cycle. Who else has something to add? One one perspective here um, is 
the defensibility or the moat, I fundamentally believe the IP of many companies today is your GTM. And, you know, if you really understand kind of what that means is that you can have 12 companies essentially doing the same thing. The winner is going to be the one that has figured out their GTM motion and is able to scale that and scale it efficiently. If you take a look at the amount of money you're going to spend in a company, uh, the, the dollar spent on GTM is almost twice that of the, your product R&D development costs. So if you can't get that right, that's going to be problematic. And some of the winners over the years is that for companies that are essentially doing the same thing, the, the company that becomes the winner is the one that has figured out their GTM. And that's why I say the intellectual property and figuring that out is, is, is really key. And it's really harder. It's a combination of both art and science, and it's becoming much more sophisticated in making that happen. That's your moat. I, I think um, maybe for the audience, I'm sure most people have read it, but it's interesting to read that uh, article that got leaked from Google. We have no moat, uh, neither does OpenAI, um, which I think is true. And at the end of the day, I think, Rob, you're totally right. Distribution, go to market, workflows, back to what we were saying earlier, knowing your customer is really what's going to, um, you know, uh, differentiate companies ultimately i do think that the tech layer will be pretty pretty standardized over time so i i was just going to add you know um uh, kind of a different way of saying tim's point from earlier which is um uh, i think there'll be the emergence of uh full stack models uh because i think data is going to be a huge mode in ai um mm -hmm. and in the past cycles what we saw was the folks who developed the products and the folks who collected the data were not the same entity. And therefore the tuning of the model was a challenge because these two companies had impedance mismatches to work with each other. Um, and so I think in this generation of companies, uh, because data is such a critical um, piece of the four things that we talked about, um, uh, you know, one of the things we see is that the emergence of these full stack models so that the, the data or the recordings in some cases in business um, product use cases uh, can go back to fine tune the models. And, and just to double double click on something that was said, uh, that Rob said, I think we'll see technology evolve faster. Well, we'll agree faster than ever has evolved. So the modes will continue to change and it will be harder and harder to continue to defend the mode just based on the technology. Um, so without uh, uh, a really well thought through and, and proven and and uh, scalable go to market, uh, it will be all for nothing basically. Yeah, can I and and one more thing I just want to mention and uh, this is not a, a very data intensive observation because I have a sample of two, uh, but this is to uh, Rob's point. In the last uh, six weeks, I've seen. Um, two companies that have gone from a standing start to half a million dollars in ARR in two months based on Gen AI technology because Gen AI is so easy to understand and 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 comprehend the impact of that in the application stack as opposed to, you know, stuff that Kier and I did a couple of decades ago, right? So uh, back to Rob's point about distribution curves and the, the arc of how fast when it hits, it really goes quickly. So I think what you're going to see is um, these entrepreneurial teams that are building Gen AI first companies get to these arcs very, very fast because it's uh, just a very much more intuitive product uh, when you get it right. And I think, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's lots of uh, exciting, exciting companies with great gro uh, growth profile that we're going to see coming out of this, uh, this cycle. Well, we're pretty much out of time. This has been an awesome panel. I want to thank, uh, uh, you know, Kira, Anand, Tim, Mar, and Rob. Uh, one thing I just throw out there's some great nuggets that came out in the last, uh, you know, the last you know, half hour of this panel. Go to market, um, you know, can you build a motor? Can't you? 
Um, there's an awful lot of innovation will come out, but you know, you know, are you building to as a supplier? Are you building to sell to end user customers? Do you understand the implications of models, data, knowledge? A lot of stuff to unpack here, but I want to thank our panel. I want to thank uh, Kieran Ring Central for hosting this. This has been awesome, and thank you very much. And we'll be signing off now. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.